Um, I've been gardening for over 70 years. I'm 76 and I started when I was two or three. My grandfather in, in Spencer, Massachusetts, and um, he let me do things in the garden and I'd hang out with him. And he was one of the original organic gardeners. He subscribed to Organic Gardening Magazine back when it was a little uh, small paper uh, printed on, on uh, newsprint. And I sort of grew up uh, in summer spending time with him from the time his wife died when I was seven. And I took the train by myself from New Haven to, to uh, Worcester, Mass. And, uh, Visited Grampy, my parents thought that would cheer him up some, and I think it did. We had a great time, and, and we spent a lot of time in the garden, which was great fun. Um, before we get started on the slideshow and look at things like that beautiful purple, purple cauliflower uh, and how to grow them, I want to talk a little bit about organic gardening, and I think it's important that we, that we all avoid using chemicals in the garden because that's really what organic gardening means which just means we're not using any chemicals we're not using insecticides we're not using something to kill the moss in the lawn we're not using roundup to keep kill the weeds we're doing things by hand and if we've got japanese beetles on the roses we pick them with our fingers and we put them in soapy water or for those of you who are tough nuts you'll just squish them the way uh, some of some of us do um, but you might want to ask me, well, why should we be organic? And I think there are a couple of different reasons. It's better for the environment, but it's also you're going to do better in the garden. Why is that? Well, a bag of 10-10-10 chemical fertilizer, there's nothing poisonous about it. We don't really know what most of the bag is because it's proprietary information. That's the 70% that is filler in a bag of 10, 10, 10. The 10 means it's 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium. Those are the big three of the minerals that plants need to grow and be healthy. They're available as salts. Well, you know salt is very soluble. You put it in water, it dissolves. If you put too much chemical fertilizer, it can burn the roots of your plants. And um, if you get a rainy period of a week or two right after you put in your 10 10 10 and you live on a hill that fertilizer has probably dissolved and washed downhill and downstream and you don't really want to be putting soluble potassium and phosphorus and nitrogen in your streams or ponds and here you are up next to a beautiful lake um, or near a beautiful lake so there are lots of reasons to be organic, and it's better for your, your health, I think, not to use pesticides, um, and it's better for your plant health. So um, let's take a look at some vegetables and talk about how to grow them. It's, I like to call this show Vegetables from A to Z, because I grow artichokes. How many of you have ever grown an artichoke? Am I the only one here? <laughs> I eat them. <laughs> yes. Well, the ones that I grow don't be, get to be as big as the ones in the grocery store. I'll never get an artichoke the, si the size of a softball. They're bigger than a golf ball, but they're more the size of a baseball and a big one. So um, artichokes are tricky because you have to start them very early. And the best thing really to do is to buy them from a good garden center. Sometimes they'll have them as a specialty item and you can get them about now. I started them from seed and you have to go through a cold period after they've germinated and they get to be a certain size and you have to grow them in a cold place for 10 days that make them think they've gone through a winter because they really only bloom in their second year. But at a certain point I decided, yes, I proved I can do it, but I don't have to do it. If I want an artichoke, I can go to um, Edgewater Farm in Plainfield, New Hampshire, and get a small one in a pot. Part of the reason I grow artichokes is that they're beautiful. Um, the foliage is lovely, and it's also an eye-opener for anybody that comes to visit the garden. And I'm a bit of a showman, I have to admit it, so I like having artichokes. Um, so here I am with my best artichoke. 
Oh. It's actually a sculpture out in California. <laughs> now, beans are wonderful. You see there, um, that's a basket of three different colors of beans, yellow, purple, and green beans. Uh, they all taste just the same. And quite frankly, the purple ones don't stay purple very much. They sort of turn gray when you cook them. <laughs> there are basically two types of beans. There are pole beans and bush beans. There are also green beans for fresh eating and dry beans. But uh, let's talk about fresh eating beans. Pole beans are wonderful, I think, because they continue to produce beans all summer long. Once they start to produce beans, if you keep picking them, you'll keep on getting beans. So you could go down to the store today and buy a little packet of Kentucky Wonder, which is the classic pole bean, put a couple of st three steaks in a teepee arrangement, tie them up here, plant three or four beans around each one, they'll grow up it, and they will produce beans starting in late July until frost. Bush beans are beans that produce all at once. They're great if you want to freeze beans or make dilly beans and can them. And you need a lot of beans all at once to process them. Then you want to grow bush beans. Of course, bush beans, you have to bend over to pick them. And at a certain age, we like to pick things up here if we can. So um, I tend to favor uh, pole beans. Either one is fine. So there are pole beans growing in the garden, some bush beans. Beets are wonderful. They're healthy, they're tasty, they're sweet. They, they last for a long time in the fall and into the winter. One of the things that confuses many people about beets is that they have these big seeds and you plant them three inches apart and then you have to thin them because they're only an inch apart or a half an inch apart or they're right next to each other. They're pushing each other with their shoulders. What's going on? Well, a beet seed is not actually a seed. It's a fruit. It's a capsule that has a number of seeds inside it. So your job, if you planted your beets in mid-May, your job is to thin your beets on the 4th of July. Because at that point, they're already big enough that you can easily pull off the ones that are too close together. And on the 4th of July, you want them to be a minimum of an inch apart or even two inches apart. If you leave them just an inch apart, then a few weeks later, you can thin them again to two inches and you can eat those leaves and beets. The leaves are just as good as the, as the beets themselves. What's interesting, and I bet nobody knows this, Tell me if you know it, but beets and Swiss chard are technically the same species. I see a gentleman in red nodding his head. He knows that. Yeah, so we plant Swiss chard. People started planting Swiss chard and beets hundreds of years ago, perhaps thousands of years ago. And then some people selected them for the big fat roots and others for the beautiful leaves to eat the leaves. And they became two different, we call them, gave them different names, but they have the same genetic material, the same number of chromosomes and genes, and they look pretty much the same under uh, genetic inspection. So what's interesting is when you harvest your Swiss chard the last time in the fall, you can eat the roots. And I've done that, and it's really quite funny. Some of them will be yellow, some of them will be red, if you've got a... <laughs> so broccoli is a wonderful crop that um, probably the easiest thing for you to do right now is to go get a six pack of broccoli when I say a six pack we're not talking Coors Light we're talking six little cells that come at the garden center for four dollars and um, that's going to give you six plants you plant them this far apart uh, and they will give you a nice head like this. I put a coin up there. What is that? A nickel or a quarter? It's a dime. It looks like a um, I think it's a nickel. Yes. Yeah. So that's the main crop is right there. But in fact, that plant will give me more food as side shoots than the main uh, head. Because once you cut off that head, 
it's going to lower down the stem. It's going to be sending out shoots that are only this big around. But it will do it until frost. It will do it past frost. It will do it until snowfall if you keep up with it. If you let, them, if the, you let those side shoots grow and don't pick them, you'll see yellow flowers. And that's still edible, but they'll give up making side shoots. So with most things like a broccoli <coughs> or beans, you keep on harvesting, you keep on getting more food. All right, <laughs> cauliflower. Cauliflower does come in purple, but I have to say cauliflower is a very fussy vegetable. How many of you have grown cauliflower? Anybody? They taste the same. They no. do. The purple ones taste just like the yellow one. And the sad thing is that it turns gray when you cook it. So I only uh, start a few cauliflowers because if the summer is too hot or too cold, too wet or too dry, it doesn't produce a nice head of cauliflower like that. And they say it buttons. It makes something the size of a side shoot on a broccoli. So unless you have a lot of sunny space, and I don't, the trees have been growing up I've been, I've been in the same house for 52 years, and I've been gardening there for a long time, but the trees around me keep getting bigger and bigger, and shadier and shadier becomes the garden. So um, I don't have as much room for, to, to grow everything that I like to have, and I have to make decisions. And cauliflower doesn't always make the team. Brussels sprouts. People complain about Brussels sprouts that they don't get them big enough. They want Brussels sprouts the size of quarters or half dollars, right? But many times they get them the size of little marbles. I know how to make it so you get the big Brussels sprouts. On Labor Day weekend, you take a pocket knife, you go down to the garden, and you cut the top of the plant off. The, the, if you don't, the Brussels sprouts plant gets taller and taller and taller, and it'll grow right up until snowfall. But it's it, those little buds down there, which are the part we eat, aren't getting bigger because it's putting all its energy into getting tall. You cut off the top, and then it'll start to bulk up those Brussels sprouts. So just remember the holidays. Fourth of July, you're going to thin your carrots and your beets. Labor Day weekend, you're going to cut back your Brussels sprouts. And again, buy a six-pack of, of Brussels sprouts now. Give them some space. They're big plants. Go this far apart. What's that? 19 and a half inches. <laughs> now, I've had bad luck growing celery. I find that slugs love celery. If you have a dry summer, your celery gets really woody and stringy. But I have great luck with celeriac, which is celery root, which tastes just the same. So look at that funny thing with all those roots down there below my thumb. That's a celeriac. You've seen them at the grocery store, I'm sure. You probably never purchased one. But they keep very, very well. If you like celery and you cook, see, I. I love to cook. I love to garden because I want to have fresh vegetables that I grew myself that are organic and I know they're safe and healthy and tasty. <coughs> Celeriac or celery root will stay in my refrigerator drawer for four, five, six months and still be just as good as the day I picked it. So in the, in the winter time, getting good celery is sometimes difficult and of the various things at the grocery store that you have to decide, are you going to pay extra to get organic vegetables or eat the conventional? Celery is one that I have read is highly sprayed and with chemicals to keep the bugs off, keep those slugs off and other things. So you don't want to buy just you know regular celery in the, I'd hate to make you worry about these things, but, I'm a, <laughs> um, but celery is a good one to get organic when you can. And celeriac is a great way to um, avoid it, you know, in a soup or a stew, it has that celery flavor. 
Here's one I cut in half. You can see there's snow on the ground behind me. They keep very well. All right. How many of you have tried growing corn? How many of you had raccoons come and visit your corn? How many people have given up growing corn? The other thing are the crows. The crows love corn when it first comes up. So what I've done here, this is a tray of 98 little cells, and I plant it um, indoors. I put one corn seed in each of those, and I put it on a heat mat, which gives some bottom heat, keep it lightly moist, and corn pops in less than a week, five days, and you've got a, a little corn plant. And I let it get up to be about this tall. And then I plant them, each little corn plant, I just pull it out of that tray. I go down the row on my hands and knees and I just plant them the proper distance apart, nine inches, let's say. And within a day, they will have rooted in hard enough that the crows can't steal it. Because if you plant the actual corn seeds in the ground, I've had this happen to me, I lost an entire field, well not a field, uh, two or three rows that were from here to the back of the room. That's a lot of, that's a lot of planting corn. Um, had them all eaten by the crows. I, I had planted corn, I went away for a week somewhere, I came back and I'm expecting to see some corn up, nothing there. Finally after two weeks, I pawed around. There were no seeds. I went down the whole row. There were no seeds anywhere. The corn had been eaten by the crows. I lived in Africa as a young man. And in Africa, they would have young boys whose job it was to have slingshots and then stay out in the field when the corn was planted to keep the birds away. Um, so that year, I did get... Uh, some nice corn and um, I always like it when I get an earworm in my corn because that shows me if I'm buying it at the farm stand that they didn't do a lot of spray um, to me it's a real simple thing to take a pocket knife or a kitchen knife and just cut off that earworm and not worry about it some people throw away the whole ear of corn <laughs> Okay, now I see where I'm going alphabetically. I'm up to dandelions, and I didn't show you a picture of carrots. But you all know what carrots look like. You don't need to see the picture. Um, and I've already told you that when is it you're supposed to thin your carrots? Fourth of July. Yeah, you, if you want to have nice big carrots, first of all, you want sandy soil, or if you have clay soil, but you're up here near the lake, you have probably fairly sandy soil. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you should have a great ground for growing carrots. Add some compost, and they're heavy feeders. So I do give them some organic bagged fertilizer. About the time that I thin them, I'll go right along the row and I'll give them some ProGrow. Now, ProGrow is made in Vermont, and it's made from things like Sea, ground seaweed, cottonseed meal, peanut hulls, uh, ground up oyster shells, all natural ingredients. So when I was talking about the advantages of being organic versus conventional, that 10, 10, 10 just has three things in it plus filler. Whereas your ProGro, it's like a seven course meal. It's, it's, it's the, the delight that you get on a, a real fancy meal. It's giving you all, it's giving you magnesium and cobalt and all other little trace minerals that you don't get in the conventional fertilizer. And I give my carrots a little bit of fertilizer around the 4th of July, just right along next to it. And I use this tool, which I brought some of these. How many of you have one of these tools, a cobra head? What do you think of it? You like it, yeah. It's great. I can just scratch the soil with this and um, add a little. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good tool. I'm selling them today. I, I, I met the guy that invented this. I was at the San Francisco Flower Show back in the 90s. And I was chatting with the guy, and, I, and he said, Well, I've got this new tool on the market. I said, Oh, that's interesting. I'm a, I'm a garden writer. He said, Oh, here, take one home. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, I had been doing all my hand cultivating with a. Uh, Cape Cod weeder. I like a single tine because it doesn't drag as much through the soil. I can be more precise and um, it doesn't take as much work to pull it through the soil as a three, 
you know, a three clawed weeder. But I'll just loosen up the soil a little bit with this and I will uh, add some pro grow and then stir it in. Is it, uh, is it expensive? Uh, I'm selling them today for $25, so I don't know whether that's a yes or a no. But it, it's only expensive if you lose them. <laughs> now, the trick to not losing this, you take a piece of orange twine or blue and white nylon rope and you put it through that hole, a nice big loop, and then when you've got it covered with a, a pile of weeds or it gets in the compost pile, you'll see that loop, something bright. And once I started doing that, I stopped losing them. Before that, I did occasionally lose them. Um, they're made in America, not in China. This is a recycled pop bottle handle. And it's a family-run business. Noel Valdez and his wife and his two kids have been working in this business for 25 years now. And they finally made it as a business. All your basic uh, seed catalogs now sell it. And, of course, I sell it. <laughs> Um, but it's a great tool. Okay, so dandelions. You're chuckling about dandelions, but dandelions are tasty. And in Europe, particularly in Italy, people use dandelions all the time. You can buy dandelion seeds from Johnny's Selected Seeds. Oh. <laughs> and in California, farmers actually plant dandelions. The key, though, is you have to harvest dandelion greens before they blossom. Once they blossom, they get bitter. They're over the hill. Um, dill is an easy plant to grow. Once it gets established, if you have a nice sandy soil, it'll get to be about yay tall. Put some compost in, maybe a little pro grow. And uh, if you let it flower, it'll drop some seeds on the ground and then the next year you'll have volunteer dill if you just grow your dill in the same spot every year it'll become almost like a perennial eggplant i'm not a big eggplant fan but i once lived with a person that really loved eggplant so i learned how to grow it and now i don't have to grow it anymore <laughs> but we won't get into that um, in likes warm weather, uh, peppers, and particularly hot peppers and eggplants, would rather be growing in Mexico. So if you want to keep them warm, there are a couple things you can do. Uh, you can take a piece, a chunk of dark colored rock, and you can plant it right, or you can plant it, you can set it right next to the plant. It soaks up the sunshine during the day, and it kicks out some heat at night. It makes it just a little bit warmer. You can also put row cover over your plants. How many of you know what row cover is? It's, it's, um, it's an artificial fabric that comes in a, in a wide piece, five feet across usually, and you can put hoops over a row of, of plants and then it will keep bugs off. And that's part of being an organic gardener. You don't, instead of using an insecticide, if you have problems, say with striped cucumber beetles, you cover your young cucumber plants with row cover and uh, it keeps them physically from getting to it. But it also keeps them heat in. So that helps them to, um, to stay warm. What does it taste like? Do they like this stuff, direct sunlight? They do. Okay. Yeah. And the more sunshine, the better for peppers and eggplants. Most of your leafy greens will grow in, in some part shade. But things that produce a big fruit, a tomato, it wants full sun too. All right, garlic, I like to say, is my easiest crop. You plant it in mid-October, and um, I, I, you can see a bed here where I've got the rows started, and then you separate a clove, uh, a head into cloves, and you plant and push them into the ground about three inches apart and three inches deep, covered up. Then I put hay or straw over it. Do I have a picture of that? Okay, so then I lay out the clothes, and here it is in the spring. Um, the young shoots are coming up through that straw or hay that I put over it. I put a lot of hay or straw over it, and that keeps the weeds down all summer long, the next summer. So you plant it in the fall, and then when it starts to curl up like this, you see on the right here, that curly cue, that's what we call a garlic scape. 
that's edible. You can fry those up in a stir fry or put them in a salad, chop them up. They're tasty. Um, but because there's basically no weeding with all the mulch I put there, all I do is I plant it and I harvest it. What could be easier? And it's healthy and it keeps vampires away. <laughs> Then once you harvest it in um, August, you dry it in a cool shady place and bundle it up and ha I hang it in my basement um, or sometimes I'll hang some in the kitchen. How many of you like horseradish in a roast beef sandwich? A few of you. Um, horseradish is very easy to grow but it's very hard to contain. It wants, once you planted it, its roots will go down literally two feet and more. You can't get it all out. If once you harvest it, you, some will stay in the ground, it'll come back the next year and come back and come back. So there are the roots um, that I'm, I've harvested that I'm going to grind up into horseradish. And um, those are the, the rough leaves. So the best control you have for horseradish is planted next to a lawn where you're going to mow it because then that'll just keep it under control. In, a defined area. I had a friend whose husband didn't know about horseradish and he rode it till the garden. He rode it till the old horseradish patch. It got horseradish everywhere in her garden. It was terrible. It took them years to get it all out. So I explained here that when you grind up the horseradish, you want to do it outside and um, you add water to it to get it to about the right consistency, then you add vinegar and it stops getting spicier. The, when, it, when it's just with horseradish and water, it keeps continuing to get hotter and hotter, but you have a bigger and bigger bite. And then add some vinegar and that stops it. Apple cider vinegar? Uh, yes, uh, you can use either one. I think that apple cider vinegar has more flavor and it's nice, but. White, some people, commercial stuff is done with white vinegar. The Henry Holmeyer model is made with, with uh, apple cider vinegar, sometimes my own homemade vinegar. I've been known to do that. I, try to, I like to grow everything I eat. I can't do it, obviously. And I, and I don't keep farm animals, so, and I'm, I'm an omnivore. But I've tried most of them. Okay, here's kohlrabi which I think is a fabulous vegetable to look at. Isn't that just gorgeous? <laughs> the first time I grew one, I was doing a garden tour. I was walking down the row, and I looked at the kohlrabi, and I jumped up in the air because I'd never seen one in real life. But they're beautiful. They come in purple and in green. Um, that's a big piece of vegetable. And that's one called gigante. It's a winter keeper. Uh, some of them, well, now what do you do with kohlrabi? How many people have ever used kohlrabi in the kitchen? Tell me how you've used it. Chop it up and um, or make it into sticks for eating out of hand. Yes, that's one way. It's great. It, it's in the broccoli family and it tastes a bit like broccoli. It's crispy and, and nice. Um, along with this lady, uh, I eat it just plain in a salad. Uh, you can stir fry it. You can put it in a, in a stew, again, and it has sort of a broccoli flavor. But this gigante will keep six months in a refrigerator. All right, melons are probably not worth the trouble, but with climate change in 10 years, if we're all still gardening, we'll be growing melons because they love heat. Nice, full sun, rich soil. Now my parsnips I eat in April. They don't get to be this size in April from this year. It's last year's crop. So I let my parsnips overwinter in the ground and I put a stake at each end of the row so I'll remember where it is um, because the, the, the tops of the parsnips are all gone by April. You dig them up, you boil them up a little bit and you Serve them with butter and maple syrup and first treat out of the garden in the, in the spring. It's just, they're just fabulous. Now what you need to know is that parsnips 
are very slow to germinate. It'll take, I plant them in June because they like warm soil to start. Even though they go through the winter outside, they want it warm to start and then it takes two full weeks and sometimes they don't germinate well. The other thing is most seeds are good for three years. If you buy carrot seeds, you can use them this year, next year, and the following year. The same thing with most vegetables. Parsnips are only good for one year. Parsnips, you buy a new package of seeds every year or you don't get parsnips. If you take last year's parsnips, and you didn't plant them all, you plant them this year, you don't get anything. Did you have a question? Freezing makes them sweet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They taste good, boy. Yeah. So it's kind of an old fashioned vegetable, but I'm kind of an old fashioned guy, so that works out. And we have the melon, and you said it wasn't worth it. Doing well, I find that the, the it's a long season vegetable, and um, there are things that are, are, are shorter season uh, melons. But if they get frosted, they're done. Right. So you you have to take a chance. For example, I sh if I were going to do melons, and actually my wife was doing melons this year, she planted them in the house a couple of weeks ago, and then when they have little short vines, she'll put them out, and hopefully by the that the first frost won't come until October, and then we'll get some melons. But if we get a September frost, we, we're not gonna get much in the way of melons. They take a while. Yeah, because the, the supermarket melons are all- I can't eat them. They're horrible. Yeah. I mean, lately you just can't get a good melon unless you find a local farm. I mean, there's, there's such a big difference between, I feel bad for the upcoming generations because they don't know what a really good melon is. <laughs> You're right. So uh, Homegrown melon is great. Uh, and you say, well, right, and you know instantly it's GMOs. Really? The genetic, genetically modified. Oh, they, the school thought was that's not a problem to be genetically modified, but if it tastes horrible. I mean, if you, you know what the good one is like that. Yeah, uh, they, they may not even be genetically modified. They may just be hybridized um, because GMOs are very expensive to develop. And most GMOs are corn, uh, soy, and cotton um, because it takes so much development time and money for, for Monsanto to develop a new strain of a GMO because it's all genetic engineering which is still relatively new. Um, so bad? most most household vegetables are not available as GMO. Do you think it's bad too or do you think it's okay? Um, I don't want to eat GMO food, no. Right. But you can, if you buy organic food or grow your own food then it's not GMO. Right. But almost all the seed companies, all the seed companies that I buy from will not sell any GMO seeds. So the melon seeds that I buy are not going to be GMO, but there are other reasons they might not be good because they've been, through trial and error, they have selected strains that are better for shipping or for, uh, you know, like tomatoes. A grocery store tomato is re usually not as good as a homegrown tomato. Why? Because the ones we grow ourselves are good to eat today and not to put in a, in a cardboard box and ship from California to, to um, New Hampshire. So, but those aren't GMO tomatoes, they're just hybrid tomatoes that are selected for certain things. And one of the main things is, how long does it last in the grocery store? If you get a melon that's only good to eat for three days and then you have to throw it away because it's rotten, you can't sell that because it's three days travel. The average piece of fruit or vegetable in America, I have read, travels 1,500 miles. The average vegetable you get at the grocery store. And then it sits at the grocery store. <laughs> okay, so there's that trick with the hot pepper. You see that big rock there? That'll make that pepper a lot happier. Okay, potatoes. I love potatoes. This year I planted over 100 different uh, potato plants and how do you start a potato plant you take a sprouting potato that you buy a seed potato and you cut it in half so each eye half has some eyes on it, little growing points and you dig a hole which I use a, a post hole digger oftentimes and then you put that chunk of potato in there if you have a small potato this size then you put a whole potato in there um, and then they grow and you as they grow you cover up that hole you know, you cover them with a little dirt now, 
and then you add more as the season goes on because you want plenty of room above the where you put your start. That's where the new potatoes are going to grow. And one of the, my favorite things is to steal potatoes from myself um, early in the summer by just going into the soil. My soil is nice and it's got so much compost over the years, it's fluffy and light. I can put my hand through the soil and grab a potato <laughs> without digging up the whole plant. Grab a potato here, a potato there, and you have enough for supper. <laughs> so these are little potato plants that are ready for hilling up or covering the, the soil. So that's a potato beetle. Colorado potato beetle arrived in America in the early 1800s, and it's now it's everywhere. The main thing to do with your potatoes, the, the potato beetles will multiply. They have a very short time between the time they hatch, the time they, they um, the, the, the egg is laid to the time you have either a larva eating your leaves or this guy eating your leaves. And uh, each generation, it's a, it's a geometric function. You know, it's like two squared is four, four squared is 16, 16 squared is 256. And all of a sudden you've got a thousand potato beetles where you started off with just a couple. So you have to look for these and pick them. And then also when the, when the plants are young, look under the leaves for orange egg mass and just scrape it off with your fingernail and put it in soapy water or the little, uh, cat the little um, larvae that are eating. But get rid of the, the potato beetles early by physically picking them and then you will never get into a problem where the beetles eat so much leaf that they can't produce spuds. You know, you have to have enough greenery producing the food to make the potatoes. But I get a pound and a half or two pounds of potatoes for each plant, so I'm figuring I'm getting 150 to 200 pounds of potatoes this year. That's more than I usually do, but this year is going to be a giving year. I want to grow extra food to share with people. Did you have a question, sir? Did you have a question? No. When I plant potatoes, I use a bulb thing. Oh, yeah, a, a bulb planter would, would make it work. Out, put the dirt right on. Yeah, that works good too. Real quick. Yeah. I got a raised bag, about three feet of mulch. Uh huh. Good. Now, here's another uh, vegetable you may or may not eat rutabaga. Now, rutabagas are often confounded with turnips, but they're really quite different. What do I do with rutabagas? Now, look at that. That's a seven inch or eight inch long piece of food. That's bigger than any potato I grow, but it's just as easy. Potato beetles aren't interested in eating it. In fact, nothing eats this except me. <laughs> but I'll put it in a, in a beef stew. I'll cut it into chunks, put it in a stew of some sort. When I make a beef stew, I make a big beef stew that's mostly vegetables, because it's healthier. And um, I cook it and I heat it up three times, at least. I'm gonna eat four nights out of a pot of beef stew. Or maybe I'll eat two nights and I'll have something else and then I'll come back to it and eat two more nights. Potatoes tend to fall apart. A lot of them, when you cut them into chunks, you put them in a stew, by the second time you've cooked it, it falls apart. A piece of rutabaga will never fall apart. It will stay as a piece of rutabaga until the cows come home. So uh, if you like cooking with potatoes, get a little pack of rutabaga seeds, thin them, and um, let them get big, and they're tasty enough. You'll like them. I don't particularly like turnips. Turnips have a sort of a bitter taste to me. They're in the same family, but rutabagas are sweet and turnips are not. Sorrel is another perennial vegetable that I'm eating right now. Um, it tastes like lemon, but it cooks like spinach. In other words, you see that big leafy green plant there, and you think, oh, that's nice, It'll be, you know, but it doesn't cook up like kale. Kale keeps its, its structure when you cook it, but sorrel does not. So what I found from reading a cookbook by Deborah Madison, who's a great vegetarian cookbook writer from California that I got to interview a long time ago. She said, you cook your sorrel with green peas 
and you get that nice lemony flavor, but the peas give you something you can actually chew on because the sorrel almost disappears when you steam it. But it tastes very lemony. It's very nice. I'm sure that, you know, it's a spring tonic. I like to eat things early in the spring that are, uh, that are good for me. Now, sweet potatoes. We all love sweet potatoes. They're like peppers and, and eggplants. They want to be growing in Mexico. But you start by planting slips, and I plant them in, in um, under plastic, black plastic, so I don't do it anymore because I'm really trying to eliminate plastic from my life, but I, this is what I, the way I've done in the past. And um, I run, they need a lot of water, so this is a soaker hose on either side running down there. It takes a lot of water. It does. It takes a lot of water, good soil. But I got 65 pounds of sweet potatoes in a 32-foot row. That's a lot of food. The tomatillos are a Mexican specialty. The first time I grew them, I bought one at, at, a, at a garden center. They didn't tell me you need two in order to get pollination. I got these big, tall plants with beautiful paper husks and nothing inside. You need a couple of tomatillos. Of course, the Tomatoes are the queen of the garden. They're the most important part of my gardening season. This year I planted 32 tomato plants. And um, I grow heirlooms, I grow hybrids. I grow, I grow a dozen sun gold cherry tomatoes. This is my go-to for dehydrating. I love dehydrated tomatoes. You would call them sun-dried, but they're, I run, I'll show you later a picture of the little machine I use for dehydrating them. Um, if you grow your own tomatoes, and they get a little too leggy, you can plant them sideways. Where you put the root ball in, you lay, you take any lower branches off, so you have something that looks like a palm tree with green stuff up here, the root ball down there, and you lay it down, and then just turn up the side and cover it over with soil, and that stem will all turn into a root, which is good for the plant later on. And also, if you have a leggy one, that you grew inside and it wants to flop over because it's a little bit not as strong as it should be, by burying that stem, it solves the problem. How do you keep your tomato, how do you teach it to stand up and be tomato a good tomato? So there's a plastic bag with um, little cherry tomatoes. I freeze tomatoes whole and um, I, I don't do anything to them, I don't blanch them, I just put them in the, and you see I've got a straw there, I'm gonna suck the air out of that bag, and I zip it up 99% of the way, suck the air out of the bag, and then I keep sucking as I pull the straw out, and I snap it shut, and you don't need a special machine. What are they like when they come out of the freezer? Um, they're like canned tomatoes, oh. because when you thaw them, they're mushy. Right, that's right. And, but what I do with the, what I call my red rocks, a full-size tomato, um, I freeze it in a Ziploc, and then I take it out, I turn on the hot water in the sink, and I hold it under the, red, uh, under the hot water, or else I'll put it in a pot with water, two or three of them, and just let it thaw a little bit, and also the skin will come off. When I'm cooking, I tend not to use frozen, the, the skin from frozen tomatoes. I just go like this, and the skin comes right off, and then I can just chop it up and put it in a soup or a stew, and it's just like canned tomatoes but it takes no time. My mother and my grandmother spent hours in the kitchen in August yeah. Yeah. canning tomatoes. I don't have the time for it or the inclination. So instead, I freeze them whole and then I, I use them all year round. So I like a big gallon bag. You can put nine large tomatoes in a gallon bag, suck out the air, seal it up, and it comes out, they are fabulous. And then I'll just use two or three in a, in a soup or a stew and, and uh, I'm good to go. This is a garden mat that I've tried using some years. It comes pre-punched holes for tomatoes and um, it keeps the weeds down. It, that's one way of doing it. Here's another way. Just use hay or straw. I use newspapers. I'll put uh, four to six pages of newspaper and then I'll cover it with uh, straw and no weeds are going to come through that. I do all my, my walkways and around bigger plants. Now obviously something like onions, you can't get the newspaper and straw between your onion plants, but for big things, um, it, it works pretty well.
then here I am removing a sucker, yeah. which is this little uh, shoot between the main stalk of the plant and a branch. So, uh, uh, you want to have enough sunlight and air coming through. Um, zucchinis are fabulous. They're very productive. Um, this is the one called Romanesco. It's a striped uh, zucchini that can get, I've grown them this big. We have a competition at the Cornish Fair for the biggest zucchini, and I've won the, I've won the prize in that occasion. Um, the nice thing is you can get a zucchini that's this big, a Romanesco, and it's still edible, it's still good. Most zucchinis get, so you don't want to eat them if they're bigger than this size. So you, you know, and that happens in two days or three days so you have to be picking them all the time and then finding somebody that wants some but these you can get a little bit bigger and they're still nice they like the heat that's an old picture i don't use black plastic in the garden anymore well let's look at a few fruits uh, elderberries grow by the side of streams and in wet places in the wild but uh, if you want to grow them get a couple different varieties you'll get better pollination and um, what I do is I, I cook up a bunch and I put them in a jelly cone and, and you've got that wooden mallet that you sort of roll around in there and squeezes out all the juices and I make a syrup that I drink in the winter time because it's supposed to help prevent colds. It's good with vitamin C and other things. I add some honey and um, ginger uh, to it when I'm making it cook it up and do a nice sweet sauce and um, it's it's a little I take a little uh, shot glass of it in the morning now here's a, a fruit you probably have never grown the pawpaw unless you came from Pennsylvania or Ohio it's like a tropical fruit and um, it does grow in New Hampshire I've got it growing right now uh, that's what the fruit looks like that's not my fruit that's from a, from a somebody else but I'm, I'm planting them now for other people quite seriously and I'm hoping that this will be a fun a fun fruit mulberry the same thing it's not a common fruit but it's something to think about they get to be big trees if you I, I've read that uh, if you plant mulberries don't plant them right near the door because <coughs> they drop a lot of fruit and they'll get on the soles of your feet and you walk in the house with them but here's one that I am, I am planting this year it's called honeyberry and it's in the honeysuckle family <coughs> um, very productive and uh, we'll see. You can grow wild hazelnuts, but I'm not sure they're really worth the trouble. Um, Shadbush is uh, very productive, and the birds just love the berries. Same thing with uh, alternate leaf dogwood. The, the birds love those berries. So some other fruits to consider. Kiwi will grow in our climate. Uh, Korean stone pine is what makes pine nuts. Um, sea berry I don't recommend because it's a little invasive. Gooseberries. And I'm, I'm working with a client in Hanover. We're planting pecans, hickory, and black walnut. We're looking 20 years down the road. So I'm going to have to live to be 96. I'm going to plant some, some pecans next week. A northern pecan. And I'll, I'll report back in my newspaper column when we get our first pecans, if I'm still writing it. Okay, uh, for dehydrating those cherry tomatoes, I cut them in half, or you can use big tomatoes. There's this Nesco American uh, Harvester Dehydrator, which is good. That's about a $125 machine. Then here's the uh, Deluxe Excalibur, which is about a $300 machine, and it's much more efficient. It uses less energy and takes less time. So that's my talk about vegetables. I want to answer your questions. Um, I do have some books up here. I will sign them. Uh, I'll just tell you what they are. Organic Gardening, Not Just in the Northeast, a hands-on month-by-month guide is from my newspaper articles and magazine articles over the years, the best of Henry Holmeyer. And then the New Hampshire Gardener's Companion is everything I learned from my grandfather and cents, all in one 200-page paperback for $17. They're both $17. And these guys are $25, and you can't live without one. <laughs>
<laughs> you don't know what you've been missing if you don't have one. All right, questions? Can you tell me if uh, you recommend planting potatoes in buckets? Yes, planting, can you plant potatoes in buckets? People <laughs> have been growing them in sort of bags about this size mm -hmm. that are about this high with okay. holes in the side. There are special bags, grow bags that they put them in. You can, I don't think you could just grow it in a five gallon pail because you would it, you would only be able to put in one or two mm -hmm. potatoes. You wouldn't get much. But it, you'd have to have holes in the bottom. It would be tricky, but it, I've never seen it done. Oh. But you can do it in containers, you know, bigger containers than a, than a, than a five gallon pail. Yeah. They work pretty well. Um, broccolini. I tried growing that last year and it got really, really tall and got one little. I've never tried growing broccolini. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I've heard about it. I've tried growing broccoli rob. Oh, I love that. Uh, broccoli rob is an interesting broccoli relative that tastes terrible. <laughs> oh, I, I I, if, you, if you pick it fresh in the garden and put it in your mouth, it's awful. You have to cook it, then it's tasty. <laughs> and the broccolini, well. I mean, it was good, but I didn't know if once I cut it, it didn't seem to come back again. Probably not worth it then. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, it's always, it's always good to try these things because yeah. maybe it's going to be fabulous. Yeah. I had one of the opposite, some spring onions that yeah. I didn't pick last year. They yeah. come back this year, huge, much better off. What's the status down below? Are they uh, going to be onions, or are they going to have onions with uh, slush inside them? Or? You're going to have to dig one up with your with your yeah. new cobra head weeder and find yeah. out. <laughs> but uh, have you had any experience with that reseeding? No. When I when I miss an onion in the in the fall, I let it then stay in the ground and because they'll bloom and have a very nice right. blossom yeah um, but i've never tried to eat them um, behind you yes um i plant my garden with a rose part of the pot so that i can lightly till between mm -hmm. is that really bad for the soil you plant your garden with what rose far enough apart so that when the weeds come up i can see oh you can rotate till. Till, um, i think that's okay um i'm trying to get away from gasoline powered machines in general so I just bought I just got a, an electric lawnmower yeah, they're great. and I love it it's quiet it, it's, it gets tired when I get tired here you go you can only mow for an hour with an electric lawnmower uh, but no it's not bad you know whatever works for you is good it, it, my goal is to encourage you to grow more have a bigger garden add an extra row so you can give some tomatoes away to somebody even if it's just an elderly person down the road or the, the the soup kitchen, whatever. I think the more that we grow and can share, it makes our community stronger and we feel better about ourselves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I yes. Have a question. I get a lot of slugs in my garden every year. Is it, is it something that I mean, I pick them off and let them just. Um, well, uh, too wet? They like wetness. Yes. Um, they don't like oyster shells. You can buy a bag of chicken grit, which is ground oyster shells that people feed to their chickens, and um, you can sprinkle it on the ground. They don't like to be sharp. It cuts them up. They don't like it. If you've got a real slug problem, that's probably not going to do it. Um, there's something called sluggo, which is slug bait. But is that good? Um, it's rated for organic gardeners. But here's the thing, they don't tell you, they say it's just iron phosphate, um, which is benign enough and it's found in nature, mm -hmm. but it's in a slug bait that they don't tell you, again, it's proprietary information. Mm -hmm. And I read a, a, a terrible review about them saying it's not the iron phosphate that's killing them, it's, it's the bait part and they won't tell us what it is. So I'm a little lurid. I used to use Sluggo and it worked really well. Yeah. Then there is the old beer trick. You put a saucer of beer out and um, they'll crawl into it, get drunk and die. <laughs> I'm not sharing my IPAs with the with the well, not IPA. Well, that's what well, like the <laughs> um, And dry years is usually not so bad, but hand picking does help. Um, you can take a, a spray bottle 
and put white vinegar in it. No, not white vinegar. Um, ammonia. A, 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 solution, a solution of 10% ammonia and 90% water, and it dissolves them. <laughs> I'm not sure if that putting, I mean, ammonia is used in fertilizers and so forth. So mm. I, I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. I have tried it, and it is very satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> but I probably shouldn't tell you about that. <laughs> but just dilute it down enough. Yes. One part to ten parts. Yeah, one, one part um, ammonia to nine parts of water, so it's a 10% solution. Yes. Gophers. Gophers. Uh, woodchucks, you mean? Yes. They ate most of my garden last year. Okay, so what you need to do is find somebody that has a have a heart trap. We tried, he wouldn't go for it. Well, you know. <laughs> okay, there are dumb woodchucks, and they're, they're easy to catch, and there are smarter ones. But you can outsmart the smart ones. It took me three weeks once to catch one. Um, but first of all, you start with the right size trap. It has to be 36 inches long Whoa. with a 12 by 12 opening. Okay. Wow. Then you have to find his hole. Okay. And you have to plant, you have to put it about three to 10 feet away from the hole on the way to your garden. Okay, so he's gonna come out, he's gonna look around, everything's good, okay, fine. He's trotting along, he says, wow, that smells good, what is that? Oh, it's an apple, they love apples. So sliced red delicious apple, or green beans, or watermelon. Those are the three things that I've caught woodchucks with. But my favorite was um, uh, a dog I had, who was a mixed breed, that was an adopted from, from the pound, and uh, somebody said, hey, Henry, there's a, wood, there's a woodchuck out there. So th the dog and I ran out to the garden, and he chased that woodchuck into a stone wall, and he sat there for hours. <laughs> and he sat there till 5 o'clock, because 5 o'clock is when he gets fed. <laughs> 5 o'clock, he said, I'm off duty. <laughs> he strolled away. But the woodchuck was so terrorized by having his dog go, <laughs> You know, all day while the woodchuck's in there, it went away. So a dog is a great deterrent. I also had a little corgi. I had it on a gardening job somewhere, and the, the guy was telling me about the terrible trouble he had with woodchucks, and I said, well, I've got a dog that probably would chase a woodchuck, so he saw it up by the barn. I let out the dog, I said, corgi, go get that. And, and he just ran up the hill, went down the hole after the woodchuck, got the front end of himself in there, he couldn't get the back end, and I could hear the woodchuck screaming inside. It was so terrified. It was wonderful. Packed his bags and was gone. We never, that, that guy never saw him again. So you can, you can terrorize woodchucks. Maybe if you put on, on a Halloween costume mask and yelled at him. I don't know. What else can I answer about vegetables? Yes. How deep do tomatoes need to go down? That's a great question because this year um, I did. I grew perfect tomato starts. They were just the right height, and I didn't want to lay them down sideways to give them extra distance. So I just dug deeper holes. So I dug holes that were about this deep, and I buried again a lot of the stem. That's also good because I have the 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 hunch we're going to have a hot, dry summer. Mm -hmm. So I don't want my roots right on the surface. I want them down deep. So I'd say six inches is fine. Oh. One of my neighbors has been uh, throwing tomatoes in straw bales yeah. with large teepees over them. Uh -huh. It's already this tall. <laughs> yeah. People try everything. Yeah, I've done the straw bale trick of you take a chainsaw and you cut a hole in a, yeah. in a, chain, in a, in a, stra a straw bale and you put good compost in there and you plant into it and it stays moist and rich and but it really is only worth it if you don't have any soil my soil is is so beautiful i'd rather just plant it in the garden but I, as a garden writer i have to try everything any tricks with voles voles mm -hmm. elliot coleman who's a great garden writer up in maine uh organic guy so he won't use any poisons or anything he said regular mouse traps um, in his greenhouse where he had a vole problem, and he said, strawberry flavored chewing gum. <laughs> and he said, strawberry flavor, they just can't resist it. The problem is, in recent years, I have not been able to find any strawberry flavored uh, bubble gum. There's so, <laughs> might work. Um, I suggested to somebody they try strawberry jam, see if yeah. that would do it. 
Probably a fresh strawberry would, but do you really want to share your fresh strawberries? Yeah. 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 And just throw it in the ground? Yeah. Um, so the trap. I, I'm sorry. Oh, it, you set the trap. You set the trap and you put the chewing gum. And I asked Elliot Coleman, is it chewed or unchewed? He had no sense of humor. <laughs> and he said, unchewed. <laughs> <laughs> we had bowls in the middle of the winter. Uh -huh. They dug up all into the ground and dug all these tunnels. We haven't yeah. seen them since. They just did the winter damage. Yeah. And, and they, can, they can ring your fruit trees and kill them if you have young fruit trees. That's why I put wire mesh around the, the base of the tree every fall if I have new plantings. Tangerot has a sweets kit. They might have that strawberry gum in that sweets store. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. And uh, do, do come up and thumb through my books. You don't have to buy a book. You can thumb through it. And, and you, can, you can feel the cobra head. You're going to love these cobra heads. Uh, no. Or chess. How long are you going to be here for? Um, I'll be here for about 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> and don't forget he's coming at the end of the month for tips on flowers. growing flowers. Yeah, so come back at the come end of the month. Come back, everybody. Thank yes. you so much, everyone. Definitely.